Thank you. Um, great to see everyone. Um, so uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about sort of the brain and long COVID. And it's actually helpful to um, sort of uh, hear the other speakers um, uh, talk about the various areas, because actually I'm going to connect some of the dots as well. Um, so I'm hoping that at the end of this session that you would recognize uh, the symptoms of long COVID and understand the potential effects of um, the virus, the COVID virus, or what's called SARS-CoV-2, um, on the brain, and also discuss some potential remedies. So um, this was taken um, the beginning of the pandemic, March 2020, and you know it, it's amazing. It doesn't feel like that long ago, but it's been three years, and it's no longer a public health emergency. But I think all of you would remember sort of, you know, the uh, really uh, caution and lockdown and isolation and testing and all those things um, at the very beginning. And so if you look at the data in Canada, um, the, those who have been tested uh, with a PCR uh, sort of nasal swab test, so the, these are not the little kits that you get from the pharmacy. Um, these are the, um, you have to go somewhere to get them. Uh, they're called PCR tests. There are actually 4.6 million cases. Um, but because we can't test everyone with a PCR test, um, there's an estimate of about 25 to 30 million people in Canada who have had COVID-19. And that resulted in about 52,000 deaths. And I think one of the um, things that we're most concerned about is the 1.4 million people um, that um, StatsCans reported as having long COVID. So long COVID has many names. Um, it's called post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 or PASC, uh, sometimes called long haul COVID or post-acute COVID syndrome, chronic COVID, uh, long-term effects of COVID-19, but really the official name um, as defined by WHO is the post-COVID condition. Now, so what is long? Is it two weeks, a month, two months, three, six, nine, or 12 months? What do you think? Well, um, the WHO defines it as um, usually three months from the onset of the acute illness. And the symptom has to last at least two months and cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. So it can't be diabetes. Um, if you are having symptoms of numbness and tingling in your fingers and um, having to go to the bathroom a lot and you've been diagnosed with diabetes, um, that's a different diagnosis. And the common symptoms of long COVID include fatigue, shortness of breath, and uh, cognitive dysfunction and it can fluctuate uh, over time. So um, the answer to, you know, what is long COVID? Like you, we use three months, but if you actually ask, um, if you say one month, um, that can be correct too. So in the US, um, the CDC is actually using the one month definition. So um, long COVID is really the post pandemic pandemic. The, there was a survey done last year now, and there's a follow-up survey that's going to release results very shortly. So um, from the survey that was done by StatsCan last year, it's estimated that 15% of adults with a confirmed or suspected infection experience longer-term symptoms. And about one in two have these longer-term symptoms for longer than a year and one in five adults actually experience longer term symptoms said that their symptoms often or always limited their daily activities. So what are these symptoms? Well, you can see trouble sleeping, brain fog, so difficulty thinking or focusing, headaches and dizziness, unusual tiredness, um, pounding heart, uh, chest pain, feeling worse with activity, or what we call post-exertional malaise or post-exertional exacerbation of your symptoms. 
shortness of breath and cough, and many, many others, as many as 200 symptoms have been described. But you can see even on this list that on this slide that a large piece of it is actually affecting the brain. So like the things on the, on the left-hand side about the uh, sleeping issues, brain fog, uh, fatigue, and also headaches and dizziness. So it's a respiratory virus, it's like a cold. So why is it affecting all these symptoms? Well, a Canadian scientist, Joseph Penninger at UBC, he used to be in Toronto. He used to work across the street from me. Um, he actually found that the SARS-CoV-2 virus entered the cells through a specific receptor called the ACE2 receptor. And that receptor is found in many different systems and in many different cells, including the brain. So you can see the brain down here. And it ha the, there are ACE2 receptors in the one of the cells called oligodendrocytes. Uh, um, and um, uh, we'll go into that in a little bit. But because it's a virus that attacks many cells and many tissues and s systems, that's why we are seeing all these very uh, very different and diverse kind of symptoms. So I want to tell you that um, I've been working with um, uh, uh, um, a, a colleague of mine uh, to lead something called the CanCoff study. Um, we, uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, we got together and uh, established 18 sites across five provinces, uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Manitoba, um, Ontario and Quebec, and it involves more than 100 investigators, and we recruited like 20, 2169 participants, uh, divided into different cohorts, so those who were not hospitalized, those who were hospitalized but not in the ICU, and those who were in the ICU. And we even have a cohort that weren't tested positive with PCR test, but um, they think they had um, the infection. And so we included a, what do we call a clinical cohort as well. And what we found is that when we put all these people to do six minute walk, so it's really walking in the hallway, you have to find a very long hallway and time people for six minutes. There are actually some Canadian standards based on your age and sex. And so we can do a percentage of what you actually can do and what was predicted. And not surprising, in the ICU group, at one month, they're quite low, and then they improve over time over 12 months in the green line. And in the non-ICU uh, uh, non group, but those who are hospitalized in the red line, they were doing better than the ICU group, but also sort of like continue to improve over a 12-month period. But if you look at the, those who are not hospitalized, we usually think of having a cold would last maybe a couple of weeks if you have a bad one. But at one month, three months, 12 months, well, these people improve too, but they don't improve back to 100% of predicted. And that's when um, we clue in that there's a problem. So um, a large number of these patients actually have something called chronic fatigue syndrome, or the new term is myalgic encephalitis, because it's an effect on the brain. And so this is a picture of one of my colleagues in, in, in uh, Montreal. Uh, she's a family physician who actually got long COVID. And she uses this analogy of, you know, you're so used to your cell phone being charged 100%. And think about having your cell phone only charging to 15% and you have to make it last for you know 24 hours because you can't charge it again. And so um, that's, that's a very good analogy for this sort of fatigue. It's not just like, oh, I had a hard day. I, you know, uh, uh, was very busy and I'm tired and, you know, it's not that. It's a very unusual um, tiredness um, that limits your activity. And you can think about it as an energy pot. So the physical activity takes out from that energy pot, but cognitive and also emotional also takes energy out of that pot as well. 
And I also want to show you that it's a bit of a roller coaster. So initially you get the, you know, you get ill. And so you're not feeling well down here. And then you feel better. So you're returning to 100% of your activities. But then it was too much and you crash. And so there's a lot of yo-yoing or roller coaster. And if you don't stop that roller coaster, then people actually do worse and worse. But if you do, do stop that roller coaster and stay under your threshold, meaning try to do things such that you don't crash, then you will slowly improve over time. Now, uh, like obviously I wanna concentrate uh, this uh, talk on uh, the brain effect. So this is someone who has a very high level job, um, an executive type job. And this is the clock that um, he drew for me. And um, uh, so you can see that it's all sort of very disorganized, right? So, and it's actually totally reversed. We use something called the rap rapid cognitive screen to screen uh, patients in Kankov. Um, and we found all sorts, of, all sorts of issues. So we also do some very special um, imaging tests. Um, th this is with MRI, but it's not something that you can get sort of um, through your doctor per se. Um, it is called the CVR protocol. So you can think about it as a brain stress test. On top, the top panel is someone who is a healthy individual. At the bottom is someone similar age and sex, but had long COVID and have brain fog. And you can see that there's a slowness of the brain uh, to respond. And you know you don't need to be a, a neuroscientist to see this. You can see a different color in terms of the intensity of the color as well, uh, using a color mapping uh, between the control, the healthy control versus someone with brain fog. So brain fog and long COVID mainly affects um, uh, three areas, executive function, reaction times, and short-term memory. And so think of your brain like a computer. Um, executive function is like organizing things and your computer can't have let you organize things in your computer. Reaction times are like processing speed. Like, don't you get frustrated when you try to do something and your computer have that circle going round and round? Um, well, that's the processing speed. And the short-term memory is like saving to the computer. Um, can you retain information? Can you save that data that you just um, read or you just learn? Um, and there's a problem with retaining information as well. So those are the three main areas uh, in terms of people with brain fog and long COVID. There are lots of mental health issues as well. Um, there's stress and anxiety as probably the most common. And it's multifactorial. It's the lockdown, it's the pandemic, it's the isolation and social distancing. But it's also the COVID virus affecting our limbic system. That's the where the area where it affects our emotions. And um, I can tell you there are multiple people who came to me and said, I don't know what happened, but um, I it like I feel like I'm a different person. I get so irritable and angry. And I'm usually a very caring person. This is what actually a patient of mine yesterday told me. Um, and she works in the long-term care. And she said, you know, like all these patients of mine are like family and I don't know what happened. Um, so um, COVID can actually, the virus can actually affects the limbic system and change personalities as well. So recently um, in June of this year um, at CAMH, so that's the Canadian um, uh, Addiction and Mental Health um, sort of um, institute, and so uh, researchers there found that there's brain inflammation in patients with long COVID. They use a very special test called the PET scan, but it's not a PET scan that you can just order, uh, your physician can order. It's a, with tagged with for a specific brain protein that is really a marker of brain inf inflammation. So what we have learned is that um, a healthy system, so on the left uh, for, for your brain, 
first their blood vessels are intact and intact blood brain barrier. There are cells like astrocytes, microglia, neurons, that's your nerve cells that are functioning quite well. But in an infected system, there's breakdown of the bright blood brain uh, barrier, there's inflammation in the brain uh, of the nerves, and there's demyelination is the covering of the nerves. And also, you know, Gord shows you sort of the synapses. There's also alteration in that, as well as alteration in the glial cell activation and many other issues that we're only beginning to understand. We know that when we biopsy brains of those who died from uh, COVID-19, we can find virus in the brain. So they, it can cross the blood brain barrier. So um, you also heard a little bit from Mary um, about sort of the uh, microbiome. Well, there's a hundred trillion organisms living on you, in you, around you. And if you think about how many organisms are in you, like you can call them bacteria, they're good bacteria, they're bad bacteria, um, as Mary was mentioning. Um, but what we're learning is that there's also a gut-brain axis and that there's a connection between the gut and the brain, and that inflammation and immune function, um, the gut actually plays a very large role. And so we're just beginning to understand how COVID affects this. So I wanna share with you this very large study from the UK Biobank. So the UK, um, in the UK, they actually will regularly do um, brain scanning of individuals who volunteer to be scanned. And um, so they were able to um, find people who were scanned before and after the start of the COVID pandemic. And what they found is that approximately is about three years apart, these scans. And they found those uh, for about 400 people who actually had COVID and and um, they also found a bunch of controls as well, meaning those who did not get COVID. In the top panels, A and B, they found that there's a shrinkage of certain areas of the brain. Um, so the blue line is control, and the red line is actually the cases, the COVID-19, uh, those who had COVID-19. And the older that you are, it affects you more. Um, so you can sort of see that. And now, um, uh, Gord also talk about the connections, the networking inside the brain, and there are special tests and special ways to actually look at that. And you can see that um, there's, uh, the, compared to controls, there's differences between those who had COVID and those not. And so this is actually a fairly concerning study for me because um, looking at this, like not only shrinkage of brain, um, but also actually the networking inside the brain cells is worse uh, for those uh, in certain areas, in the temporal area, in the, um, in the area where you concentrate on smell and taste. Um, and so there are differences that can be shown. And moreover, you can also see that, again, the blue line is the control and the red line is the cases. So these are sort of like test your func brain function kind of test. It's called trails A and trails B. Um, so it's two different tests where you connect the dots. And the cases, uh, especially in the older population, uh, were much slower in um, connecting the dots um, for trails A and trails B. And you can see basically is really those who are 60 and over. And so um, those who are older, it may affect them more in terms of cognitive function. So what can we do about it? Well, um, if you don't get COVID, there's no long COVID. So masking is still a good um, you know, way to prevent um, COVID. So I can tell you, I just flew uh, from Toronto to Sask uh, Saskatoon to visit my son. And uh, I, I'm wearing a mask still because um, there are people coughing. Actually, the person sitting next to me was coughing on the plane, not wearing a mask. Um, so even though COVID-19 is uh, much lower compared to before, um, 
there's still COVID-19 around. And so mask is actually an easy way um, to prevent not just COVID, but flu and other respiratory virus. Think about also good ventilation. Um, you don't want to be in a stuffy room. You want to make sure that there's good ventilation. You can go outside and do things. Um, well, maybe <laughs> currently may not be the best example because of all the smokes and from the wild, wild uh, fires. And vaccination is the other one. Um, you know, if you haven't had a vaccination um, uh, uh, since the fall of last year, maybe time to consider um, another vaccination. So those are uh, actually in the fall, there will be new guidelines coming out uh, in terms of vaccination. So uh, if you don't get COVID, you don't get long COVID. And there's data to show that if you get um, more COVID times, it's like, you know, not just one infection, but three or four infections, you have a higher risk for long COVID. And actually vaccination protects against long COVID. So this is a what we call a systematic review, meaning they look at a whole bunch of studies and try to combine all the results. And it shows that it looks like vaccination protects against long COVID. So what to do about mental health issues? If you have anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress disorder, you should see someone and talk to someone about this. Um, uh, there are um, non-drug therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, um, uh, dialectic uh, behavioral therapy, DBT, or mindfulness meditation, and praying helps too. Um, sometimes we do need to use medications, and so uh, when we do need to use medications, they can be very helpful. What about the fatigue and brain fog? So you have to assess how much you're doing and then sort of um, really think about what your priorities are and make sure you have adequate rest, adjust your activities. Um, that's the resting and pacing piece. So unlike other things, um, pushing it may not help. So I have many athletic people who actually have long COVID and they are very frustrated because I have marathon runners who can't walk a block without being short of breath, fatigue and brain fog and other things. Um, so this, I think, um, you know, in terms of the exercise piece, we do suggest doing something, but always stay under the threshold. And obviously adequate fluids and adequate nutrition, <clears throat> having a balanced nutrition is important and having adequate protein is important as well. You heard from Mary about sort of what other um, things may help uh, brain health, um, but I would add that uh, protein and, and some fats are important as well. What about sleep? Um, so, Sleep hygiene is important, like not using your computer or iPad or phone or uh, TV uh, an hour before bedtime, making sure that you're relaxed, um, have a soothing drink or music, turn off the lights, and make sure that your room is only for sleeping and not to do all these other things. Um, make, make the room cool. And sometimes melatonin and magnesium can help. But melatonin is a really poor sleeping aid. It's best to use it to, for uh, regulation of circadian rhythm. And so I usually tell people to take it sort of around sundown and make sure that you, you know, go outside for half an hour, an hour in the morning when you get up. And magnesium is uh, helpful for uh, muscle relax uh, as a muscle relaxant. And also think about um, uh, contributing to research. There are lots we don't, don't know or understand. Doing something meaningful to help find solutions together. It can also help you access to special tests or experts that are not otherwise available clinically as well. So I wanna tell you um, that we have been using sort of oxygen and uh, rebreathing um, as a, a therapy for brain fog. We're almost, almost finishing phase one um, and we'll go to a phase two trial with that. We also are running something called the Reclaim trial for long COVID. Um, and this is really getting at the root causes, um, especially inflammation, uh, immune dysregulation and um, 
endothelial dysfunction. It means that there's some uh, abnormal function of the lining of the blood vessels. And so it really targets those. And it's really trying to see if we can cure uh, long COVID. So to summarize, um, I told you what uh, long COVID is and how SARS-CoV-2 affects the brain and what we can do about it. And so I want to conclude by saying that, um, uh, you know, there are many patients, um, and an, I expect that you may know some as well in your family or your friends, who feel that they are being ignored. Um, and it's not only being ignored by the government, um, but ignored by healthcare providers, ignored by family and friends, think it's all in the head. Um, and, um, you know, think that they're not working hard enough um, to uh, get better. Um, and I have heard stories about, you know, um, couples who are sort of uh, divorcing and other things as well. And so, like, I would just suggest that be kind. Um, sometimes you don't really know where that person is at. And what I can tell you from a very sort of um, medical perspective is that, long COVID and brain fog is very real and that it is a physical condition with mental health consequences. And so um, uh, I think what Ezra uh, shared really um, resonate with me. And so I, I, I would uh, ask that you pray for these patients and, uh, and uh, be kind to them. Um, so these are some of our websites. Um, uh, CanCov.org has some educational material for patients on resting and pacing, on breathing exercises and other things. Uh, the Reclaim trial is the trial that I'm talking about um, for uh, trying to treat long COVID and we're open um, in Toronto. Uh, and there are other sites in Ottawa, uh, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Montreal, Sherbrooke. Uh, that are opening as well. And lastly, I want to tell you a little bit about Long COVID Web, which is a national research network uh, with um, across sort of basic scientists, clinicians, uh, clinical researchers, health services researchers, health outcomes researchers, population health people, and policy maker. And like the whole group is about 300 people. Um, and uh, we're all trying to find solutions uh, for uh, long COVID. So I'm gonna end here and uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, so I think the vaccines are very good at preventing people getting hospitalized. Um, so especially at the very beginning of the pandemic, um, we had young people without any medical problems um, uh, dying from COVID-19. Um, we don't see that as much anymore. Um, so the vaccines have been very good about sort of keeping patients out of hospital. Um, and, um, you know, we have had, I don't know how many doses, uh, you know, worldwide. And yes, there are some people with side effects and I see them as well. Um, um, I, but I would say majority of people have done really well. And I think those who have had vaccine, um, uh, especially sort of the uh, two primary series and, and, and at least one booster, um, have uh, after those three doses, people have really um, not been going to the hospital. We still see people in the hospital, but they usually have medical issues. And so um, I think that has really changed um, in terms of uh, at the beginning, it was pretty bad. Um, you know, uh, there are families who lost um, both parents. So I have a patient who lost both parents and a sibling uh, who's quite young uh, to COVID-19. And those three people were at different hospitals, um, you know, at the peak of the pandemic, when we were running out of beds and no ICU beds, like, uh, so, you know, the, my patient had uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Like it was like waking up one day, uh, like, you know, and, and no more family um, anymore. Uh, so, I mean, we don't see those um, as much uh, these days.